there, this is James, and you're watching Tixie Live presents Hashtag Ask James. And a very good afternoon to all of you, and all of you a very happy Wednesday. Today's episode is going to be on a topic sent in by a regular viewer, and today's episode is going to be introducing from fundamental analysis. Fundamental analysis. But... Before we get into all of this, or we need to find a detail on what fundamental analysis actually is, don't forget these little videos are for educational purposes only, and in no way whatsoever should ever be taken as financial advice. So I always suggest you do your own research, do your own due diligence, and of course, know the risks at hand before entering any trade. With that out of the way, let's get started. So before we begin, I need a quick swig of water. Before we get, begin, a uh, big shout out and thanks again to regular viewer SMF790 for this suggestion uh, on this topic. And don't forget, hashtag Ask James is very different from the normal Tixie Live broadcast where it's more market driven. This is educational driven where we discuss a subject of your choosing in more detail, in more detail. So don't forget, you can share those suggestions. But anyway, let's get started on the topic of the day, which is fundamental analysis. So what is fundamental analysis? Well, basically, fundamental analysis attempts to measure an asset's intrinsic value by studying economic and financial factors. Now, the intrinsic value is actually the underlining value of an asset, underlining value of an asset, okay, the actual real worth or value or fair price of an asset. Fundamental analysis takes into account anything that can affect the asset's so-called physical, so to speak, value from microeconomics factors such as conditions of the economy, industrial conditions, to microeconomic factors like expertise of the company's management. This is, you take this into account when you're looking at stocks. The overall purpose though, of course, is to identify if the assets is overvalued or undervalued. Because this way, if you identify this, you can potentially spot a trading opportunity. Now, in a nutshell, fundamental analysis is used to determine, like I've already mentioned, the real or fair value of an asset. When using fundamental analysis, the investors looks for an asset trading at a price lower or higher than its real value. If the real value is higher than the current market price, then it's considered undervalued and could present a potential buying opportunity, which makes sense. So say, for example, just, just, just choose an example. Say uh, we have Google, for example. Um, Google's currently trading random number. Okay, so say it's currently trading, say, $120. But you go into the fundamentals, you actually think the real value of that stock should be around 125. So if that's the actual fair value, you think that then obviously presents you a buying opportunity. And the other thing they look for, if a real value is lower than the car, current market price, then it's considered overvalued and could present a selling opportunity, a selling opportunity. So say, for example, I could use another example. Let's use Twitter, for example. OK, see, so Twitter is trading at fifty four dollars uh, and twenty six cents, for example. OK, and you think. Again, using fundamental analysis, going in a little bit deeper, the actual proper value of that share price should be 30. So then again, it presents you a selling opportunity, a selling opportunity. But like I say, fundamental analysis is different from several of the. Of, of, of the assets. So let's go through some of them. Okay, let's go through, first of all, let's look at currencies. Let's look at currencies. Now, what makes, say, the US dollar higher or move higher against, say, the Japanese yen? Or it could be the euro against the dollar or the sterling against the dollar or any currency pair. Because let's face it, this is why I went into my work to pull out a bit of an example. This this bit of paper, okay, all currencies are made of the same bit of paper, aren't they? 
None is particularly lie uh, laced with gold or uh, special metals in it. It all it all has you know it's all made of the same same paper. But what makes one currency more valuable than another? What makes say something like the euro more valuable against say the British pound, for example? You know when when you're doing imports and exports, what makes the value you know stronger? And the answer is pretty simple, and that is a strong economy equals a strong currency. Now let's break this down in a bit more detail. Because let's, let's, let's say let's, let's look at currencies to begin with. Now fundamental analysis with currencies is used not necessarily to estimate the value of this, but the value or future condition of the economy this currency is from. Okay, and the way the market looks at this is they look at key economic indicators. Okay, key economic indicators. These in can include the likes of retail sales, consumer price index, housing starts, building permits, industrial production, manufacturing production, GDP, interest rates, unemployment, job growth, producer, uh, producer price index, and so on and so on. Okay, all these indicators the market focuses on to, to try and predict the state of the economy, which means it could affect the value of this bit of paper. Now, we're not going to go through all of these because there's there's so many to go through, but let's just go through a couple of them, which is uh, is key, especially at the moment, because this is another thing about when it comes to fundamental analysis as well, certainly with currencies and with uh, economic, the market tends to focus on one story at a time, one story at a time. Um, and at the moment, the story, as we all know, is inflation. So let's break down some of these key key economic indicators and how it can affect the value of, like I say, this bit of paper. Now, first of all, let's start off with the consumer price index because let's face it, that is dominating the market as it stands as it stands, especially after yesterday's uh, US CPI reading. Now the consumer price index, of course, are those of you who watch me on a regular basis, the normal TC Live uh, episodes um, I talk about this a lot because it really does drive the market. Now, the consumer price index measures the total value of a basket of goods that us consumers will spend our money on, or what we need to buy, be it energy, food, clothing, stationery, electronics, everything, the rise or increase in the price. Okay. And if obviously the prices are increasing, this is going to affect our buying habits, which then in fourth affects the economy as well. And as we all know, as we all know, as we all know, we are currently living in a world with extremely high inflation, extremely high inflation, which is really moving in the market. So CPI is a major economic indicator because the higher the inflation of a country is, leads to two things. Okay. A, the consumer is struggling to be able to afford to purchase stuff and we need to spend our money. And secondly, more importantly, which we we'll come on to a little bit later in a bit more detail, the action of the central bank in question, how they fight inflation. OK, so this is why it's a, it's a major indicator, because if we have a high inflation reading, then we try to double guess what the central bank is going to do in the future. And that can drive the value of, again, this little bit of paper. There's something else as well. Gross domestic product. Now, gross domestic product basically measures the, the health of a country's economy. It takes in, into account public spending, corporation investment, government investment, because all these things will be high and we will spend more money when the, when the things are good. The government will spend more money on infrastructure and services when things are good. Businesses will spend more money with inventories, expansion when things are good. So GDP takes into account all of those things, the higher the GDP number, the healthier that country's economy is, which again can lead to that currency increasing in value. Leads me on to another thing, retail sales. Again, this links back to inflation as well. Today's modern, econo uh, modern economy is so reliant, so dependent on us, good people spending our money, 
relies on us to spend our money buying the latest, so I don't say, Samsung phones or iPhones or clothing or cars or this. Because obviously, if we don't spend and buy these new products, the money doesn't go back into the system, which, of course, then has a chain effect. You then have shops who are struggling to make ends meet, which then, of course, has an impact on a manufacturing because they can't produce enough stuff which is not being bought. So obviously, the more we spend our money, the healthier the economy is, and it's better because we're putting more money into the system. The less we put into the system, then the less money or the less strength that economy actually has, which again links back to the consumer price index. If things are more expensive, we might not spend so much more money because we can't afford to. So that has uh, obviously a knock-on effect. Unemployment and job growth goes without saying. The higher the unemployment level, the more people you have, A, an unemployment benefit, and plus more people who are, un who are un unable to put money back into the system because they can't afford to put money back in the system because they're unemployed. So you're looking at strain on, obviously, the social services. And at the same time, a lack of, uh, uh, of um, a, a smaller number of people able to put back in and job growth. As well as another thing, like a non-farm payroll, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me, is another example. If we're creating more jobs, then again, obviously, there's growth in that economy. If we're not creating jobs, then there's a slowdown in that economy. Again, all fix the value of that little bit of paper. Okay, the more growth, the more valuable that little bit of, bit of paper is against the other country, countries' currencies. You see. So that's another thing. And there's other factors, not just NFP, of course. You have initial claims, people signing off unemployment benefit or claim accounts. Average earnings is another thing. How much does it cost an employer to employ that, uh, that, that individual? Is it going up? Is it more expensive to employ them? If it's more expensive to employ them, that means that employee salary is going up, which in turn means they can then afford to buy more things or spend more money. You see, so that has another, uh, another fact. But all this... All this really leads to one thing, and that's interest rate decisions. Interest rate decisions. Now, the one way that interest rate decision basically dominates pretty much the strength of an economy in so many ways, because there's two, there's two things a central bank does when it comes to interest rates. They either tighten, what's called tightening, or they loosening, or they loosen. And basically, tightening basically means when they have high inflation, the economy is pretty robust, so they increase interest rates. That way, it's more expensive for us to borrow, and we're more likely to put our money into savings because we're going to get higher interest rates because of it. And that makes sense. Okay? And this is what they're doing at the moment. As an example, this is why the CPI is such a mover. The consumer price index moves the market dramatically. It's the one way to fight inflation is with high interest rates. And that's what they're trying to do now. That's what, that's what they're trying to do now at this very moment. Because let's face it, if we just go over inflation, what, 8.3% in the United States, their inflation target is 2%. UK, 9.9% .9 today, their target is 2%. So that's why they're increasing interest rates. The other thing they do OK, is loosen. What they do when they loosen interest rates, this is when the economy is at a stagnant level. There's no growth. It's slowing down. It's struggling. So what they then do is they lower interest rates. Why? Because it encourages us as a consumer and businesses and industry to borrow money because it's cheaper to borrow money with low interest rates. So with cheaper and lower interest rates, with cheaper money, we can then buy that money and guess and put a surge into the economy. We could buy more stuff. We can take out loans, buy new cars, clothes, you name it, mobile phones. Businesses can borrow more money to invest in infrastructure, equipment, staff, growth, things like that. And this weakens the, the, the currency. Because it shows and indicates that the market or that the, in the, the market is struggling or the economy is struggling. So tightening technically increases the value because it shows that the, that the central bank is confident the economy can take it, is in a good state. 
So it raises interest rates. Loosening says they're nervous. So they need to do a cash injection. So that's why they reduces it. The other thing for it as well is international investment. If you have high interest rates, then an international investor is more likely to invest in that currency because then they get more bang for their buck. They're going to make more of it, aren't they? Because of higher interest rates. Then a country with a lower interest rates. At the same time, if you have high interest rate, your high currency is cheaper. Uh, it's, it's, it's cheaper for you to buy things, but more expensive for you to sell things as well if you're an importer because your currency is strong. So that, those are all the sort of factors to, to bear in mind. Um, let's move on. Let's move on to fundamentals for stocks because they're, they're pretty different. They're different because there's two main things when it comes to fundamentals for stocks. You could do it in the same way we could look at currencies, but I prefer looking at economic indicators and trying to look at the whole picture of where that economy or that country could go or be in the future. That's how I like to look at it. But with stocks, it's a bit different. First of all, you have quantitative um, fundamental analysis with stocks. This is information which can be gathered by using numbers, figures, ratios, mathematical formulas. And there's qualitative fundamental analysis. This is where you look at the actual quality of the company or the company's services and products. So it's a bit different. So let's go through uh, some of these now, because really, when it comes to stock fundamentals, you're looking to identify a company's value and it's actually actual worth as a business. So let's start with the quantitative uh, fundamental analysis. Now, this includes revenue, profit, assets, financial statements, things of this nature. So, of course, this is where the market looks at earning, earnings reports. Now, we had earnings season just a few weeks ago. We saw the market react because, obviously, earnings, earnings season is where a number of massive corporations release their quarterly profits. And, obviously, it makes sense if their profits are better than expected, uh, expectation or worse than expect, uh, expected. Hello, James. Yeah, thanks to the There are a lot of aspects to view. Are they all important to look into for currencies, or would you focus on certain ones? That's a really good. That's a really good question. Look, if I go back to my um, what I said at the beginning, the thing when it comes to currencies, in particular, the market tends to focus on one story at a time. It can focus on lots of different stories. It focuses on one story be it unemployment, be it this. But at the moment, the, the market is absolutely obsessed with inflation, which makes sense because inflation is at record highs, and interest rates because we've had so many central banks raise interest rates quite aggressively. And we, we've been through years of negative interest rates. So that's what the market is focusing on. So at the moment, CPI, interest rates, and other, other data in the US in particular which could lead to them being more aggressive like retail sales, but mainly is inflation and interest rates dominate the market. At other times, at other times, the market will change and look at something else. Okay, it depends on the story. And your next question is right, because I always keep a, uh, an eye on the housing market, but the market's not talking about that yet. When the market starts talking about that, that's when I will look at it. Because house starts building permits, they all come in to center stage, but it's a very good point. And I know you watch my videos because I've talked about the housing market because I think that's a story waiting to happen in the future. But anyway, anyway, but good point. Very good point. Um, so, yeah, earnings report. So like we said, we had a number of earnings um, come out in the earnings season, Google, things like that. All that can drive the market. So if you're looking at fundamental quantitative analysis, you would look at earnings, but you would also look at size of the workforce. All these can be all these are numbers. Though, don't forget these are numbers I'm talking about. Size of the workforce. You know, are they growing with the numbers of employees? Are they growing, slowing, or are they like, even decreasing? Are they letting people go? Again, these are all numbers which you can uh, deal with. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, so like I say, it's all about the sales of the workforce, you know, this sort of thing. Um, you know, are they growing? Are they increasing? For example, just, you know, we look at it, Goldman Sachs. I think it was Goldman Sachs, are reducing their, their staff. So that's that's not a great sign for them. Earnings per share. Again, it's a number. How much is their share going up per, per quarter? Are they growing? Are there um, shareholders? Are they profiting? Are they benefiting? 
So that's another thing. Projected earnings growth. Again, this, these are numbers. Quantity is all about numbers. You know, are they, uh, you know, what's Microsoft's prediction for the next quarter? Are they indicating growth? So again, that is fundamental analysis. Because obviously if the company is growing, then obviously that share price is likely to increase. If it's decreasing or if it's struggling, it's likely to decrease. Debt to equity ratio. How much does the company owe? Where is debt tied up? And how much is that compared to their debt to the equity to what is owned by the shareholders? Are they relying on their shareholders' income or the shareholders' dividend? Sorry, shareholders buying in to raise the money they need to carry on existing or growing? Or do they have their own pot of cash flow which they're able to move forward? And that's just a couple. There are so many different, when you're looking at quantitative, so many numbers you can look at and read. And all this is available, of course, for you to read and research. It's all there out there for free. So you can get this information. Now let's move on to the quant uh, qualitative fundamental analysis. And this is different. Again, this takes a bit more digging and a little bit more thought. Because this includes key executives, brand awareness, patent technology. And let's break it down. <clears throat> First of all, business model. What does that company actually do? What's its service? What's its product? What does it do? What does it do? Okay, so it, it, that makes perfect sense. If you see a slowdown in, if, if it's, for example, a manufacturing, let's, let's pick on Apple, for example. We know what Apple does. Apple makes computers, tablets, and of course, the infamous iPhone. So how good is their latest product? Well, how well received is their latest product? Is it, you know, is it getting good reviews? Is it popular? Are people standing around the corner of the street to buy it? You know, that sort of thing. That's sort of thing you need to bear in mind. Competition. How is the competition doing against them? Why is Samsung better? I'm not saying Samsung better. I just prefer Samsung. But why is Samsung, for example, still outside selling the iPhone? Or is there going to be a change in the market? What are they doing differently? Management. Who's running the show? Who's in charge? What expertise do they have to drive the company forward? You often see this. You often see this. The market or a, a stock or a share price can suddenly dramatically move because there's an announcement of we're taking on Bob Jones as CMO, for example. He has great experience in social media, whatever, and he's going to bring so much to the table. And say Bob Jones is well known, the share price can skyrocket. Or even so, key members of management may decide to leave, and that can affect the share price, uh, the share price because that expertise of that individual is disappearing so maybe the company will not do so well without the expertise of that individual so management who's running the show economic situation economic situation there's another one in our current climate there is a lot of fear at the moment high inflation so do people have enough money in their pockets to buy the latest iphones or do they have enough confidence to buy the new phones so how is that company going to favor in the future? If people aren't willing or can or are not in a position to spend their money. So that's another thing to bear in mind as well, the current climate. So all these things, all these sectors, when you're looking at fundamentals behind a stock and a share price and a company is all down to these, these things here. Moving on to fundamentals for commodities. Very different. In, in some ways, you look at it slightly different. And that is commodities are dominated by supply and demand. How much demand is there for that commodity? And what are the supply lines like? The supply line's good. There's plenty of supply. And that can affect the price. And as well as that, what is the commodity actually used for? Let's start off with oil, which is, of course, one of the biggest or most traded commodities on the market. And it's been in a lot of headlines recently for a very, very long time. And we all know what oil is used for, mainly is for energy, propelling vehicles, planes, cars, ships, heating buildings, electricity, industry, plastic, solvents, lipstick, and petroleum industry, and lipsticks. Actually used for lipsticks, believe it or not. So it's used, and it's used for a lot, lot more. So obviously oil, 
is greatly affected by supply. And we know what has happened over the last eight months in reference to oil. We've had huge concerns about oil supply ever since the war in Ukraine has really kicked in. OK, so supply is a massive factor. So this is why we, we look at what OPEC is going to do with their production. Are they increasing their production or de decreasing it? If they decrease it, it's going to affect supply. If they increase it, supply will there'd be plentiful. It's say with crude oil inventories in the US. We look at that. How many inventories do we have in storage? Is there an excess? Or are we running out? Is it low? Those sort of things. How many um, oil rigs are operational, are producing oil? Again, are they reducing or lowering or increasing oil rigs? How are they doing with that? You know, will Iran, for example, will it, Iran get its nuclear deal across the line, meaning that Iran could then start supplying its oil to the rest of the world, which will increase probably by, you know, over a million, I think they can do over a million barrels a day. So that, of course, inc increase supply to the market, which will affect price, will decrease price. But then, of course, there's demand as well. Demand's the next thing. How's the economy doing? Are we growing? Is industry growing? Is manufacturing growing? Who's the biggest user of oil? One is China. How, how strong is their economy at the moment? Or is it slowing down? Which it has shown signs of slowing down due to the COVID lockdown. So that is a factor which affects price. Are we on the brink of a recession? That affects price because demand will start to wane if we are. If we're in good and we need plenty of it, and there's plenty of demand for it, higher prices. Another thing, let's look at copper. I'm West Country, and I can't really say that word properly. What's it used for? Electrical equipment, wiring, industrial machinery, roofing, plumbing, just to name a few. It's a major industrial metal. So the question we ask then, how's industry and manufacturing doing? Is it growing? If in industry and manufacturing is growing, then obviously demand for the industrial metal will grow. If it's slowing down, like it has done, we've shown signs of it, and copper's been under pressure, then it shows signs that demand is waning, so it's not so popular. So again, that's fundamentals which can affect the price. Let's choose a soft commodity. S sugar, for example. Sugar. Okay, obviously we know what it's used for. It's used to sweeten things, care, bakery, cooking, but it's often used for other things like flavoring, coloring agents, etc., etc., etc. But it's a crop. So what do we again take into account? Again, we take into account demand, but slightly differently. We look at the harvest. Has it been good weather this year in the sugar, you know, sugar producing countries? Has it been good? You know, with sugar cane, have, have they had they had a good crop? And again, you can find this information out from, like, say, for example, the ASDA, which is the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture. They produced these reports showing us crops and uh, weather conditions, things like this. So, again, when we're looking at soft commodities like cotton, wheat, for example, if we look at wheat, look at the problem we had with wheat, the, the, uh, the increase in price of wheat. Fundamentally, we, we understood why, because... Ukraine was a big producer of wheat and we couldn't, because of the war, couldn't get its wheat out. So again, this is one of some of the things we take into account. And of course, we wouldn't be talking about commodities if, if, if at least I didn't bring up gold. And of course I'm going to bring up gold because gold is used for so many things, okay? It's used for electronic uh, devices as well, manufacturing, jewelry, you name it. It's called, used for a number of things. But really, <clears throat> certainly when it comes to the market, the main attraction of yellow metal is a store of wealth, okay? If the market is nervous, okay, if there's times of conflict, times of economic slowdown and concerns, people put their money into gold because it's considered a safe haven, a store of wealth. So whenever people are nervous, the market moves its money into that. So again, current conditions of the market. Is it nervous, confident, or scared? You know, that sort of thing as well. So that needs to be taken into account when looking at gold. <coughs> of course, you still have demand issues, uh, supply issues, of course. 
you know, because obviously some of the two of the biggest producers is Australia, and miners, when I say not producers, miners of gold is Australia and South Africa. And I remember, just to share a little, uh, a little story with you, I remember years ago when I was, literally was a gold trader back in 2000, uh, 2008 this was, I remember that there was uh, huge uh, blackouts in South Africa. And South Africa is probably the second biggest miner of gold. And it, it was re they were really struggling with their mining production of gold. And that affected prices greatly. It affected prices a lot. So that's always something to uh, bear in mind, things like that. So, I do, so supply is still a thing when it comes to gold as well. Um, and same as demand, for example. It's not just a store of wealth, but you have Indian wedding season, which you know they buy a lot of gold. So that can have an impact on prices as well. So that's the sort of thing. The, my final point I want to talk about with commodities is understanding because commodity prices fundamentally can also drive certain currencies as well. And gold and oil are particularly a part of the commodity currency club. So for example, as I all mentioned, okay, South Africa and Australia, really good miners of gold. So if you have higher gold prices, then quite often you could see the Aussie dollar benefit, the Aussie dollar move, move higher, because why? The prices of, of gold are going up, then obviously Australia's gonna make more because they are a big miner of it. Same with the South African rand. Gold prices are high, but technically, fundamentally, it could have impact on the value of the rand, because obviously they're the second biggest miner, so that's gonna impact them. Oil, if oil prices are going up, then oil producers, uh, producers always, that's gonna, that's gonna affect the value of their currency. People like uh, Canada, the loonie, the Canadian dollar, they are a commodity-based currency. So if oil prices are high, the Canadian dollar is going to benefit. The Norwegian krona, the NOC, again, oil producers. If oil prices are moving higher, then obviously the NOC is going to benefit. So that's something else as well to uh, bear in mind. But anyway, like I say, this is um, an introduction, to be honest, because there's so much more. There's so much more you could go into with fundamentals. Like I say, the, 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 the crop reports, we could go into that. Um, the commitment of traders report, COT reports, uh, we could go into that because that has fundamentals as well. And I, I probably would do a video on that at some point. But don't forget, these, um, these hashtag Ask Jameses, they're more like a bite-sized piece. Um, I will be doing proper full-blown education webinars, which will be going on for a lot longer in the future. So do keep it, and I'll be a lot more detail as well. These are like little teasers and a little breakdown. They're not so uh, full-on. Um, I will be doing bigger ones in the future. So bear that in mind. Um, don't forget, you can ask me questions anytime at all. Don't forget, or simply say hi if you like. Or um, let me know if you found this information useful. Was it the right pace? Was it a bit too wordy? I mean, it's not like obviously with the technical where I can send you, um, show you charts and trend lines and candlestick patterns. Because it is more, like I say, it's more down to getting to know the actual intrinsic value of something. It's more detailed in going into the the full story of something, not just looking at price action or previous price movements. You know, so there's a lot more to it, and it's not so visually interesting. But market-wise, it's incredibly interesting. So it's worth worth knowing. Okay, good, good, good. So it makes it more understandable as a novice. Thank you. No, no, that's good. I'm glad it, it's glad it, you know, you made it a little bit more uh, understandable um, because everything has everything has a as a part. Now, one thing I will say: one person asked me uh, the other day, and I will add this add this on. Um, so I said to me because because I was a gold trader back in the day when I first started. I was a gold trader, and when I started back in two thousand. Uh, and six, it was more because I was a gold option trader. It was more fundamentally based. It wasn't so technical. It, technicals were being used, don't forget, back way, way, way before that. But the way I started I was more fundamental. So I always used to do the more fundamental uh, side of things. And so somebody, and I often talk about economic indicators as well as levels when I do the TC live shows. Uh, someone asked me, do, do I think fundamental analysis is more important than technical analysis? My answer to that is no. I don't think it is more important than technical analysis. I think both should be worked together. And I think both as a, a partnership together 
And I think that technical fundamental and market sentiment should always be taken into account when you're looking at trading, when you're looking for opportunities or looking for, um, you know, making sure, uh, you know, uh, you're controlling your trading. And the other thing I would go into that, I'll go to four things, actually. Fundamental, technical, market sentiment and risk management as well. That's another key, key, key factor is to bear that in mind as well. Um, don't forget, as well as that, you can share topic ideas live with me now, if you like. Um, if you have a topic you want me to do next week uh, any, or in the future, just let me know. If you have uh, a certain topic you want me to do, just let me know. Um, if not, if you think of one later, you could put it in the comment section on either YouTube or Facebook. I will see them and I will reply to them next time I go live on air. So uh, bear that in mind. OK. All right. If there is no further questions, not a problem. Don't forget, I'll be going online again later today, around right about 5, p uh, about, sorry, 2 p.m., UTC, maybe 2.15 UTC to cover the US session. So please come along for that. And uh, like I said, I hope you found this little episode interesting and useful. I really do. I really, really do. And please keep those topics coming in, those ideas coming in so we can do uh, do more of them. Anyway, anyway, till next time, like I always say, if you watch me on Facebook and you enjoyed this little video, by all means, you know, give us a follow. If you're watching on YouTube and you enjoyed this little video, subscribe if you like. Hit the notification button. So you know next time I'm going live. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, give me one of these. It's nice to know that you like what I do. I can see I've got a couple of likes already, which I really, really appreciate. Anyway, till next time, don't forget these little videos are for educational purposes only and in no way whatsoever should ever be taken as financial advice. I always suggest you do your own research and do your own diligence. And of course, Know the risks at hand before entering any trade. Till next time, every single one of you, trade safe.